Good evening, everyone. Erev Tov. In this beautiful, intimate setting. Um, tonight is a very special night. Um, we're going to get to learn. We're going to get to think. Um, but I believe that the most appropriate way to begin the evening is that lots of people write lots of different books. Um, some more important, some less important. Some primarily appreciated by their parents <laughs> and purchased by their parents. And some people from time to time write a book that really matters. They write a book that after they wrote it, you know that for years it's going to be a reference book. It's a lens to which to understand reality, to understand something. Yossi's book, Like Dreamers, is one of those books. And I'd like to start this evening by thanking Yossi for writing that book. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and let's delve in. Um, let's talk about your book. Your book is trying to tell the story of Israel. You started in 67. Last night, another such book of equal importance was read and discussed. Ari Shavit starts in 47 or 36, or, or earlier. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> <laughs> you understand the idea. <laughs> now, we're not having a debate a spe or, or a cross-conversation between books in the present where, when one author's not here, but you made a decision to start in 67. And it's not like, oh, I happen to find a bunch of people who are interesting in this. You, <clears throat> you chose that moment to tell the story of Israel. Why, is, why do you believe 67 is the time to start and not, let's say, 47? First of all, uh, good evening. <laughs> and thank you, Daniil. Thank you for, for those wonderful, warm words. Um, I'll... I'll I'll offer a personal answer and a Jewish answer. The personal answer is that I discovered Israel in the summer of 1967. Uh, I was 14 and the war had just ended <clears throat> and my father said, we're going. We're getting on a plane and going. Now, this was so unusual in those years that my entire eighth grade class came to the airport to see me off, and they were all there to see me return to find out how was it, what happened. And was anybody there that summer, summer of 67? So it was the summer of love. It was, there was San Francisco and there was Jerusalem. And it was the happy ending of Jewish history, or so it seemed that summer. And that was the moment when I knew that I was going to live here. That was the moment of falling in love. And even though things didn't quite turn out the way they seemed to be going uh, that summer, uh, it was, for me, an irrevocable connection. But I think that something similar happened to the Jewish people as a result of 1967. In some ways, I think of the period between 1948 and 1967 as prelude. This was an Israel that that was taking physical shape, but had not yet really coalesced in terms of its identity, wave after wave of immigration. And it was an Israel in which there wasn't a single significant Jewish holy place, for example. It was an Israel that was trying to circumvent Judaism and to some extent Jewish history. 1967 returns us for better and for worse to Jewish history. It puts Judaism back at the center of the struggle over who we are, what does this country mean? And so for me, beginning 
<coughs> with the Six Day War, beginning with the paratroopers who, who stood at the wall and then go in radically different directions, was really a way of telling my generation's story. And maybe there's one last point that I, I, I can offer, which is that the book tells the story of the generation of Israelis who were born with the state. Born, most of them more or less around 1946, 47. And when I was uh, becoming a, a young writer, one of the most, one of the formative books that I encountered was Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie. And Midnight's Children tells the story of a group of Indians who are born at the stroke of midnight uh, with Indian independence. And he then proceeds to tell the history of India through these lives. And reading that, I felt this, this deep writer's envy. I said, there's got to be some way to tell the Jewish story in a similar, in a similar fashion. And so when I discovered this, this group of paratroopers who in, in some ways are emblematic of Israel and in other ways are, are, are definitely not, they're, they're a very specific cut of Israel, the Ashkenazi elite, both secular and religious, but very, very, a, a small part of the population. I nevertheless felt that this was the device that could help, help me tell something of that story. But this is really interesting. The Holocaust was such a central part of your upbringing. By choosing to tell the story from 67, <coughs> you in essence break your story of Israel. You're, you're telling a contemporary story of Israel which is in many ways completely disconnected from the Holocaust. It's very interesting, you know. Uh, today is actually uh, my father's yard site, and he died uh, in 1978 uh, on a visit to, to, to Jerusalem, and he's buried here at Haram Nuchot, and he was a survivor. And uh, I was thinking about this before, Daniel, that you got Sinai from your father, and I got Auschwitz from my father. But you wrote a book about Sinai. I did. <laughs> what a I did. I did. It's remarkable. It is, because I felt in some way that I, I had told that story so often before as a writer. My first book was about my father and my relationship with him. I made a film when I was, when I was younger about my relationship with my father. And I just felt I, I wanted to tell the story of Israel on Israel's terms. Now, the Holocaust, is, it's, it always intrudes in this story. But it, it, it moves in and out of focus, uh, as I think it does for many of us. And, and I, I, I felt pulled to try to tell a post-Holocaust story. A story yeah. in which spirituality had a central dimension? Absolutely. Absolutely. The book uh, really functions, I'd say, on two levels. The first most obvious level is that it's a story of left versus right. Uh, the, the main characters either become leaders of the settlement movement or leaders of the peace movement. But the, the, the deeper layer of the story is that it is about kibbutzniks and all of the peace activists are deliberately, th those, that I've th those that I chose were all secular kibbutzniks versus religious Zionists. And these were the two streams within Zionism that wanted more than a mere safe refuge for the Jewish people. And I, I, it's hard to get those words out because what, what wouldn't we give today for a safe refuge? But there were these two streams in Zionism, the religious Zionists and the kibbutzniks, who envisioned the return to Zion in, in classical Jewish messianic terms that the return to Zion would be a world transformative moment. And these two movements were in some ways the repository of, of this, this classical Jewish notion of the spiritual meaning of return. It would not be for us alone. Religious Zionists believed that our return would literally trigger the coming of the Mashiach. And the secular kibbutzniks, at least in their earliest form, believed that we were creating here a light to the nations, a model of the world's purest form of democratic communism, and that and that, that was the fulfillment of the, of the prophetic vision of messianic times. And so the book is called Like Dreamers because it deals with the fate of these vast dreams 
that we brought home with us, these, these, these dreams that, that we imposed on this traumatized little strip of land crowded with refugees from the century's uh, worst traumas. And, and so the, the, the center point of this book really is about who are we beyond the secular state? Because I think that in the end, and this is certainly true for me, I think that, the sec that secular Zionism, and I say this with, with a great amount of regret, because I love, I love secular Zionism. I love what it did for us. It, secular Zionism saved us from the Holocaust. Not during the Holocaust. It didn't have the strength to save us during the Holocaust. But psychologically and spiritually, it saved us after the Holocaust. It, what, it is what allowed us to recover. And so I have deep veneration for secular Zionism. But we all know that it is a spent force. And part of the aimlessness in Israeli society today, and I think that a large part of the aimlessness the drift in diaspora Israel relations is a result of the collapse of this extraordinary force that brought us from the Shoah into Jewish renewal, both in Israel and I would argue to a large extent in America as well. And now that force is spent and we don't yet have a new force. And my, my intuition is, and I think it's the intuition of all of us here, it's certainly the intuition of the Machon, is that that next force, that next inspirational wave, must come from Judaism. And we're all trying to figure out what that means. Let's look at your two heroes in the book and see, get into your soul to the two people who you love the most. One is Arik Achmon and the other one is Yol Binun. Arik, you present almost like Forrest Gump. He's like no matter what's happening to Israel <laughs> since 1967, he's there. It's like at every single stage, not only is he there, he's sort of, he's fighting, he's leading, he's doing. And it's interesting that you have such a person. Ara, can you stand up and take a bow? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there, you love him. You love him. He's... Uh, there's something profoundly heroic about him, and I'd like you, that's what, you spend almost the most time on him, and he keeps on appearing, it's like, it's, it's like he's almost the model of something core Israeli mm. that you connect very deeply with. And conversely, you end the book with Yoel Binun, which you don't end the book with your own statement, you give him the last word. And um, there's something about him that, that hits you very, very deeply. Both of them, I, in reading the book, those are you, the two people who you love the best, the most. Um, what is it about them, and what is it about Israel through them that you're trying to teach us? Well, first of all, Danielle, you're absolutely right. Those are my two favorite characters, and they are, for me, the two heroes of the book, and very, very different men. Arik Achmon is the soul of secular Zionism, exactly this spirit that I spoke about a moment ago. Uh, and uh, one of the, the, the comments that I make in the book is that Arik was born in 1933. He's the oldest uh, of the characters, uh, the only one not born close to the establishment of the state. But I write that, that he was, in a way, the Jewish people's intuition that something profound there needed to be some profound answer to what was opening up in 1933, and that answer is represented by the birth of Arik Achmon and his generation. And they are the, the Jewish people's survival mechanism. And, and Arik, as he would put it, does not have a spiritual bone in his body, which I personally disagree with his assessment, but he is, deep, he is deeply secular. And of all the characters in the book, he actually is, he's my closest friend. He's 81 years old, and we speak all the time. We argue about everything. And, um, and I just adore him for precisely that reason, that he represents 
that Israeli who carried the Jewish people on his back without, without ever expecting anyone to say thank you. And one of my deepest satisfactions in writing this book is returning Arik Achmon to the Jewish people so that we now know his name. Because otherwise, he was completely forgotten. And when I knocked on his door one day and said, I'm, I'd like to write a book uh, about the paratroopers of 67, and somebody gave me your name, and he said, you don't know anything about this story. And I said, well, that's true, but I'd like to learn. And he said, you'll never learn this story. You're a yelet chutz. A yelet chutz is a kibbutz term, and it's not a flattering term. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, you're right, but what you kibbutznikim never understood about us Yaldei Chutz was that we were spies among you. We were watching every move you made to learn the ways of the natives. And we ended up knowing you better in some ways than you knew yourselves. And Arik, Arik became my partner in this book. He read five complete drafts in English and went over literally every word, correcting mistake after mistake. And, um, and toward the end of this 11-year process, he said to me, uh, Yossi, ata kvar lo yeled chutz. <laughs> and I, and I, felt, I felt like he had pinned, you know, he had pinned a medal on me. <laughs> and uh, it really was my process of becoming an Israeli after 30 years. And uh, so that's Arik, the soul of secular Israel. But it's, it's not so much a soul. Tell me more. It's like, what is this about? I, I, I get a feeling that I'm getting in a w in, into a window into the first of Yossi Klein Alevi's Ten Commandments. Thou shalt carry the Jewish people on your shoulder. Always be ready for an emergency. That's Arik's ethos. And La uh, Amod is and the that's, expression. And that's, and that's when Israelis are at their best. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's the yes. religiosity. Of, That's the religiosity of secular, of secular Israel. Ju of secular That's Israel. right. This deep sense of, of responsibility for, of for the Jewish story. And Arik was, Arik was the guy who planned the crossing into East Jerusalem in 1967. He led the crossing of the Suez Canal in the Yom Kippur War. He was always there. He really is the Forrest Gump. But there are, what, what you realize is there are others this country is full of Forrest Gumps, yeah. and which is one reason I'm very nervous about the book coming out in Hebrew. <laughs> because, because, you know, I'm telling Israelis what happened, and uh, <laughs> they were there. So, uh, so it is, without doubt, one of the most beautiful things about this country. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, and uh, a sense, you know, he told me once, just, just as an aside, he said, you know, in, um, in the 1960s when... Uh, when, we were, when the paratroopers were really coalescing, he said every Shabbat we used to uh, just get into a Jeep and, uh, and drive around along the borders just to check how everybody's <laughs> doing. I said, you mean checking the paratroopers? He says, no, we checked all the units. And I said, you did this, was this part of your, your miluim? He said, this was our own initiative. We didn't tell anyone we're doing it. And we just went because we only trusted ourselves. We needed to see how everyone was doing along the borders. And that's really the soul of secular Israel at its best. Yoel? Yoel. He ends your book. Yoel is, say it again? He the, ends your book. He ends the book. And you know, Daniel, if you ever want to know what a writer really thinks, and especially in a book like this where I'm supposedly above the fray and I don't uh, impose my own point of view, but see where, who a writer ends with, who a writer allows the last character word. the last word, and that's, that's generally who the writer most identifies with. And Yoel Binun took responsibility for Judaism. And initially, the way that played out in his life was to become one of the leading theologians, I would say the leading theologian among the younger generation of Gush Amunim, of the settlement movement, one of the founders. He founded several settlements, uh, Alon Shvut in Gush Etzion. He was among the founders of Ofra. And 
if you would have met Yoel Binun in 1975, he would have been virtually indistinguishable from all the other young men uh, with, with beards and large kipot and tzitzit flying and dancing on the, across the, the hilltops. And gradually, as the story unfolds, something begins to come undone for Yoel Binun. And he realizes that there is a profound contradiction in the theology that he's been raised with, the theology of Merkaz Harav and, and of uh, Rav Tzvi Yehuda Kuk. And that contradiction is between achieving the wholeness of the land of Israel and the wholeness of the people of Israel. Now, in Kukian, classical Kukian theology, the wholeness of the land must result in the wholeness of the people. And in, in those circles, they were very fond of quoting a line from the Zohar that the land of Israel enhances the unity of the Jewish people. Or quoting, for example, the origins uh, of the name Hebron, Melashon Haver, and that Hebron makes all Jews friends. Should I repeat that? <laughs> So it's a book about dreamers, right? It's a book about <laughs> <laughs> and and Yoel begins to realize that that there's a choice to be made. And the choice is between the wholeness of the land and the wholeness of the people. He also comes to realize that there's another built-in contradiction in the Cookian philosophy, which is the veneration for the Israeli government any Israeli government, which is essential in the Cookian worldview. The government of Israel is the seat of divine will, according to, to Rav Tzvi Yehuda Kuk. And yet this movement comes to challenge the democratic authority of the Israeli government, because there's, there's something that supersedes the authority of, the, of, of democracy, which is prophecy. And in Cookian circles, they believed that they were the repositories of the renewal of prophecy. And so Yoel bin Nun is increasingly torn between these contradictions. And eventually, he allows himself to open up to a third contradiction, which is the gap, or I would say the, 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 the travesty, I'll use that strong a word, of of celebrating the redemption and, as, and of identifying the messianic process with reunifying the land of Israel, which means the occupation of another people. In other words, the redemption process, which ultimately is supposed to lead to greater freedom, greater the ultimate human freedom, is a process that is based on occupying another people. And this, this becomes increasingly for Yoel bin Nun a religious problem. Now again, bear in mind we're talking about one of the most important theologians that the settlement movement produced. And when I, when I you asked me about, about heroes, when I think about courage, the, it's the courage to change. I would divide the characters of this book into two camps and they're not necessarily left and right. It's those who evolve as the story evolves, who respond to changing circumstance, and who realize that their ideology, their worldview is inadequate in the face of, of change, changing circumstance, and those who remain the same. And you have left-wing characters and right-wing characters who belong to both camps. In the camp of those who evolve, I would put Yoel bin Nun as, as the, the chief rabbi of that camp, and also Arik Achmon in terms of his ability to emerge from being this one-dimensional sabra who suppresses his emotions to becoming this extraordinarily feeling and self-reflective person. But as Yol Binun evolves, he becomes ever more tragic. And in the book, it doesn't come together. He still is the Eretz Yisrael, he's still looking for a solution. Um, he's, like, he's in the midst of his evolution. Um, he's alone. Um, 
he walks, you know, he, he, there's this sad trip that he's taking in Jerusalem. It's, it's like you feel like he's almost disconnected. What, there's, it's a sad hero that you're trying to, is there something tragic that you're trying, because it's also in the book. There is you know, it's like, tragic. like Dreamers is an unbelievably optimistic story. And then it's about the story of the, who united Jerusalem, you know, the great holy of holies, the united Jerusalem, but they divided a nation. Um, there's something tragic that you're trying to, there's some criticism that you're trying to push. And Yoel is your voice. What is it? I'll, um, I'll come back to, um, for a moment to my father in answering your question. And um, actually, I, I, there are a number of things that I want to say about my father. Uh, one is in relation to your previous question about, about heroes, and the other is in relation to dividing a people. And for me, my father really was, was my hero growing up and, and remains in some ways uh, my, my, the prototype for me of a hero. Uh, he survived the war in Transylvania he had been uh, in the Hungarian labor camp and escaped. And then when the Nazis came, he and two friends went to the forest and they lived in a hole for the rest of the war. And my father was always someone who said, don't go with the people. Whatever the people think, you do the opposite. Because the people, when they tell the people to go to the trains, the people go to the trains. And that was really my father. My father was the ultimate iconoclast, and I think it's true for many of the survivors. And, and my father really had a sense, in addition to, to being his, a, a radical individualist, a deep sense of responsibility for the Jewish people. And he was not an educated man. His education was interrupted by the war. And as a result of that, he had to be, he became a businessman. And my father was very much a frustrated Jewish leader. He wanted to educate the Jewish people and tell them how to survive in a, in a hostile world. That was his vision. And, and you are the son of a, of a powerful Jewish father as am I, in very different ways, and yet maybe not such different ways, because uh, I think we were both raised with a strong sense of responsibility for the future of the Jewish people. And again, in different ways, with different emphases. And, and, and so my, father, my father's emphasis was on Jewish unity, keeping the Jewish people together. And I was raised with stories about his town in Transylvania, uh, Nodkaroy in Hungarian, Kare today in Romanian. And this town was a, it, did, it wasn't a real place for me. It was this symbolic kind of stage on which all the failures of the Jewish people at, were acted out. Uh, the rabbi of my father's town in the 1920s uh, later became the rabbi of nearby Satmar and became known as the Satmar Rebbe. Uh, Rabbi Yoilish Teitelbaum. And my grandfather, who was the president of the Jewish community, was Rabbi Yoilish's right hand. So I was raised on, on the failures of Jewish leadership. My father seethed against the, the Hasidic rabbis who told their followers to stay put and not go to either the land of Israel or America. He blamed the Satmar Rebbe for the deaths of his friends. And so, and my father would tell me stories about the infighting among the Jews in his town. B'nai Akiva against Satmar, one Spinka Hasidim against Satmar Hasidim, and how the Satmar Hasidim used to put glass in the bottom of the Spinka Rebbe's mikvah, and all of these, all the stories that we know, you know, but it really began apparently in Transylvania, or maybe it began 4,000 years earlier. And, uh, and so, and my father made very clear to me that in some way the Shoah happened. And I don't know to this day if he was speaking uh, metaphysically or politically, but in some way the fatal sin of the Jewish people was that we, didn't, we were not united even in the face of destruction. And so in a way, I, I haven't thought about this quite. I think that, that your question really triggers this for me today, is that this book in a way or the, 
the, the, the focus uh, of this book, which is really about moving from the peak moment of Jewish unity, which is June 7th, 1967, not since, not since Sinai, I think, were the Jewish people as united as we were during the Six-Day War all over the world. United in this trajectory, first of existential fear, then relief, and then ecstasy. And to move from that peak moment to the subsequent 40 years of, of divisiveness and, and, and intensifying uh, schism and even hatred among Jews. And so in some way, this, this is a Holocaust book. This is the story that I learned from Yoel my father. Learned, Yoel learned the lesson that your father was trying to teach. Yoel is the Never hero. let your ideology That's be exactly. more important than your commitment to the Jewish people. That's exactly it. My father would identify with Yoel Binun of all the characters here. It's beautiful. That's exactly right. That's uh, very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this, in a, by picking 67, um, and when you read the book, and uh, you know I'm a fan, I love the book. <laughs> um, it's, you're telling the story of Gush Emunim. Yes. Of you, the heroes, three of them. Um, it's disproportionate. There's a lot of other stuff going on in Israel. You know, and anybody who will read Ari's book or your book are going to wonder, like, what else happened? Right. Well, you have an excuse. You're stuck by whoever was in that unit. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, it's like who I found. But it's not really true because there were other people. Yes. There's something. You are unbelievably critical of Gush Emunim, But there's, you tell the story in a very, very loving way. Um, you tell it in great detail. You go into particulars. Um, you don't really like Hanan Parat. To uh, say. There's something, um, he's the antithesis of Yoel <laughs> in a certain, in, yes. and now that you say, you know, you look for people who change, maybe his sin was that he didn't change. Um, you have a little ambivalent relationship here or there with, um, Yisrael Harel. with Yisrael Harel, but you also, you love his love for Israel, and there's something very romantic. Like, Gush Emunim, like, there, you want to tell the story of Israel, its challenges, its beauty, and maybe its failures through Gush Emunim. What is it about Gush Emunim that, that captures your soul? Because statistically, they're not, numerically, they're not that large. There's something about them that for you is dominant um, to understand Israel today. You know, I, I have to admit, Daniil, that every time I go out to the territories and I see these white stone houses rising from the White Hills, I get this involuntary thrill. And then I calm myself down, and I think about the political consequences and all the rest of it. But emotionally, I, I, I'm very much the, w the way you describe. Uh, Arik Achmon uh, recently told me that he said, the problem with you is that your head is OK, but your heart is all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, it's I, okay. You're I, critical of them. Your, your head wins at the end. My head does win, I think. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's also telling that I end the book with, with a hero from that world mm. who becomes the heretic of Gush Emunim, but nevertheless is still deeply connected. So what is it? It's the fact that they're, they're building the... In, in your Ten Commandments, that we, we now have three of them, um, what is... Why are they so exciting? What is it that captivates you? Gush Emunim had the intuition that already in, in 1973 with the Yom Kippur War, and it's interesting that Gush Emunim, the settlement movement, was not founded after the Six-Day War, only after the Yom Kippur War, only after labor Zion, the labor Zionist government lost its credibility, its legitimacy, in 1973, did Gush Emunim, did the religious Zionists feel that they now had the responsibility to step into the void because they were seeing the collapse of, of secular Zionism? And what's interesting about Gush Emunim is they were never emotionally resonant with the Likud. 
They always had a very ambivalent relationship to the Likud. They used to say that Menachem Begin never built a single, a single kibbutz or moshav in the land of Israel. They saw themselves as the continuity of the kibbutzim, of the chalutzim. And what they felt resonant with, with the early kibbutzniks, was that sense of utopianism, that sense of redemption. And what I love about them is what I love about the kibbutzniks, is that they not only took responsibility for the Jewish future, in whatever way that worked out, but they were taking responsibility for the, the, mythic, the mythic dream of redemption. How? By throwing themselves fully into becoming the next avant-garde of settling the land of Israel, of completing the land of Israel. And by, and where, where I feel their intuition was right, even though it was expressed in a, in, a, in a deeply destructive way, and theologically as well, their intuition was that secular Zionism was spent and that we need to, to the next stage in Israel's evolution will be the trying to figure out what Judaism, what is Israeli Judaism? And they, they used to speak about, they don't speak about this anymore, interestingly. They've now lost they're all that. about security. They've lost, it's all security. But what they used to speak about is the Judaism of Eretz Israel, as opposed to the Judaism that was, that was born in the ghetto. And, and that's the same as secular Zionism. Well, this is it. Potentially, they could have taken Judaism in a direction that secular Zionism took the Jewish people in. They could have, they could have liberated Judaism in the way that secular Zionism liberated the Jewish people. But they remain, and Yor bin Nun said, I asked him once, what went wrong? What went wrong with, they used to call it Torah Eretz Yisrael. Why is Torah Eretz Yisrael leading us back into the ghetto? And he said they were yeshiva bachers. That's what he said about his friends. He said, we, we were yeshiva bachers. We couldn't break out of the mentality of being a yeshiva bacher. Which is in many ways the antithesis of Torah Teretz Yisrael. Absolutely. So they, they, they tried to fashion themselves into a redemptive avant-garde in, this, in the way that the early kibbutznikim were in a redemptive avant-garde. But they didn't have they didn't have the conceptual tools to, to break into the next level of Judaism. Let's go a little bit contemporary. Um, you ultimately called them people who divided a nation. And there is a deep critique against them. Um, and Yol is the hero who, who loved the people and his respect. Like you're so careful to tell the story of his um, almost reverence towards the, Rosh, the, the Prime Minister of Israel, like a reverence to a Rebbe, and no matter what it is, it's like they're... Towards they're, Yitzhak Rabin. Towards Yitzhak Rabin, but, it's, but it was the Malchut, yes. even, because like there was... Yes. Um, um, but ultimately, they divide a nation, and, um, and they move us in the wrong direction. Now you're in 214, and you look at this country, and you look at one of the instincts that you saw each one of them embody. The country's not with us. If Arik says Aharai over the Suez Canal, we're going to say Aharai, let's hold on. Let's create facts on the ground. Um, and that was Yisrael Harel's genius. Um, he did it. They started with a little this and a little negotiation. We're going to be in this army base for this. And then, woof, we turn around. Now, in the book, you say that divided the nation very much, I think, from the perspective of Yitzchak Rabin's uh, murder um, and the, the, the exit, really, of Gusha Munim from the, stat, from the mainstream of Israeli society. But now in 2014, you look at Israelis, how many of them think that peace is realistic? How many of them are demonstrating for peace? Status quo is just fine. The settlements don't seem to bother most Israelis. They're sort of okay. Would you say that from today's perspective, could you still say that Gush Amunim really divided the nation? Or did in, in a very deep way they win precisely because they're not developing a Torah of Eretz Yisrael. They're speaking, they adapted. 
The Torah of Eretz Yisrael, which caused them to create the ideology of uh, Yigal Amir, of Kedusha, and of, now they're about security. They've been mainstreamed. So people still talk about settlers, but in a deep way. Did they win? Are they, are they really? Could you really say that they're dividing the nation today? Or are we who feel that way, are we being anachronistic, telling us, talking in, in the language of 1995, 6, and 7, post-Oslo? And now we're... I would, I, could you really say the same thing today? I think that uh, Israel today is much less divided than it was in the past. And it's, it's interesting to, to play out for a moment where the settlers won and where they lost. Uh, they won, at least temporarily, if one freezes the frame to this moment, they won in the sense that we're all going about our daily business in this country without any real sense of alarm about the settlements, and they're there. On the other hand, they lost ideologically. They failed to convince a majority of Israelis that under no circumstances should the settlements be touched. Uh, in principle, if there was a deal on the table, a majority of Israelis would support uh, dismantling settlements. And we saw that during uh, the withdrawal from, uh, from Gush Katif, from Gaza, uh, when uh, those who demonstrated against the withdrawal were, were almost all from the religious Zionist community. They looked around and the rest of the country was indifferent. So in a way, this indifference plays out in both ways. Uh, when, when the settlers feel that they are in a state of, uh, of, of existential threat to their enterprise, very few other Israelis share that sense of, uh, of They're urgency. Alone. They're alone. But, but wouldn't uh, they also take the, you know, the, the withdrawal from Gaza and... I had this shocking experience the other day um, when we went to Shiloh with our board and we met there a settler out of central casting. It was like he was growing um, oil and we well, don't grow oil. <laughs> you, what is it? <laughs> Making oil. It was just uh, like... That's and so, why they're winning because they know how to do those <laughs> things. <laughs> No, and he's there, and he's talking about his olive oil and his future plans because everybody now likes olive oil, and he has, I don't know, a gazillion dunams, which, and he's like, looks apart, and he's telling you how, you know, oh, the West, it's not, there's no danger. This is, there's no danger, and everything's just fine, and that's just, and then someone asked him, if the government of Israel would ask you to leave, would you leave, or would you stay in Eretz, is, would stay in Eretz Israel? And he looked, and he, you know, the tzitzis were 47 feet long and the payas were 30s. It was like the whole thing was just going there. It was like literally the poster child. And he said, I'd protest, but I'd leave. Because for me, there is no value to Eretz Yisrael without Am Yisrael. And you saw it the same thing in Gaza. At the end of the day, That's right. they walked the religious Zionist community protested alone, but walked around Kfar Maimon and then went home. Yes. They, didn't, they didn't send 50,000 people. And I think most settlers, as Yol Binun, maybe he's not as tragic. Have they made the same decision? Um, and are they therefore possibly far more mainstream um, in Israeli society as a result? Well, I think in terms of, uh, of Yol Binun, he still believes deeply that the the messianic trajectory remains more or less in place. Right. And uh, there'll be mo a little more land, a little less land. No one said it had to be all the land from the river to the sea. Uh, in fact, after Rabin's assassination, he wrote a, uh, an op-ed, which I think he came to regret, I found it in the archives, uh, where he called the Oslo process messianic. He switched his messianic passion <laughs> as a result of the assassination. And uh, he said uh, that just as it was the secular left that founded this country while Orthodox, most Orthodox Jews were opposed, he said it was the secular left that had the intuition that peace is, uh, is the next mm -hmm. phase in the messianic unfolding. So, so Yol Binun is, is, a, is a profoundly optimistic Israeli. 
Uh, in terms of, of the settlement movement and its relationship to, to the mainstream, I think that Israelis very much regard settlers as part of, as part of them, as part of the mainstream. Uh, that's, that's a function of the army, most of all. Uh, the, the, the shared tent really defines who is part of this mainstream and who isn't. And that's one reason, I think, why it's so urgent to get the Haredim, or as many Haredim as possible, into the shared tent. And the settlers really have made a tremendous mark on the army. It's one of their great successes. Uh, the, the Achilles heel of the settlers in their relationship to, to the mainstream is the minute but significant lunatic fringe among them. And we might, we might, may very well have seen that lunatic fringe acting again last night in the murder of this, uh, the Arab teenager, the boy from Shuafat. And, and we all know, more or less, you talked about central casting. We know the profile of it's who possible. this is. We don't know who did it, but the fact that we think that it's possible. That's right. That, so that already is, is, is an indictment of, of when, I say, when I say that it's a tiny fringe but significant, it's significant because they have important rabbis backing them. And I think that in the coming days, we should pay very close attention to the statements of Rav Dov Lior, who's the chief rabbi of Kiryat Arba, uh, Yitzhak Ginsburg. There are a number of rabbis that, uh, that, that have a recurring poisonous role in, 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 in the most murderous acts that have emerged from us in, in over the years, from Baruch Goldstein perhaps till, till literally today. And, um, and so this is a, a, a fringe that has, that has greater reach than its numbers. And the rest, and, and the Israeli mainstream, when, when, when the mainstream looks at the settlers, it feels on the one hand a great deal of respect for these people, their, for their courage, for the responsibility that they feel for the Jewish people, for the state of Israel. And on the other hand, there's something that untrustworthy. The, the mainstream is afraid of this movement. Mm -hmm. Is this going to literally blow up in our faces? Let's switch gears for a moment and go to the only person in the book. And I, don't, I didn't fully get it. <laughs> um, the only person in the book who doesn't fail, Avital um, Geva. He's the only one, uh, even Arik doesn't really fail, he just gets old. <laughs> uh, he eventually is not in Miluim. It's like this guy who's done like 400 days of Miluim a year. Um, everybody else is sort of, it's like he's just till, like he's constantly. Like the age of 65. And, it's just, and his wife still, it's like he still has a family. It's like there's something interesting. You know, okay, I'm going, bye honey. Anyway, that's a whole interesting dimension there. But we'll sort of, um, but everybody else, there's a tragedy to them. There's something they, they dream and it falls apart. The only one who, who's dreaming and fight, and you could have told his story as if he failed too because the kibbutz dies. And he could have been this lonely figure outside, out of touch with, still thinking that cucumbers are important while Israel's in another place and he's, I don't know, painting some mountain. You could have, you could have portrayed him as, as a mainstream who became sort of, but that's not the story you tell about him. You lovingly tell about this, this person who perseveres. Avital Geva. Avital, and why is he, what is it about him that, that you want us, because while everybody else is, has said goodbye to the kibbutz movement, mm -hmm. you, want us, you want us not only to remember Arik, you want us to celebrate Avital. Why? Because Avital is the embodiment of the messianic vision of the kibbutz. And he knows that the kibbutz in its current form is over. And I, I, I've, I've been very close to him in these last years. His kibbutz, Ein Shemer, which is a, a, one of the seminal Hashomer Atzair kibbutzim, really one of the old Marxist, the, the diehard kibbutzim, uh, just in recent years started to privatize. And I, I, uh, if I ever write an epilogue, it will be about watching Avital go through that process of deep, first rage, then mourning, really the, the, the whole Shiva process, and then acceptance. 
And what he is devoting his life to, he's now in his 70s, is preserving the spirit of the kibbutz, trying to transmit the spirit of the kibbutz to a new generation. And Avital founded an ecological greenhouse in Kibbutz Ein Sheme. Uh, my daughter Moria is now working for him. She's a, an artist, and they do all kinds of art projects. It's known as Yiddish and 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 um, and Avital has created a place where Ethiopian immigrants and and Palestinian Israeli kids from Um El Fahem, nearby Um El Fahem, uh, kibbutz kids, all come together to learn cooperative labor, to learn love of agriculture. And he's not calling it socialism. He's not calling it kibbutz. He's calling it Israeliness. And he's trying to figure out what is it of that, of that backbone. This kibbutz was the backbone of this country. What is it that we need of the, of the old kibbutz? How do you transmute the spirit of the kibbutz, once its outmoded ideology has died, how do you preserve the spirit? So I, I think I'm getting your fourth Ten Commandment, and that is that you shall be a dreamer. It's like this, Absolutely. you just, anyone Absolutely. who has a bigger, it's like you yes. just fall in love with them. Yes. You're like, this. It's yes. like you yes. can't help yourself. Yes. So let me right. end by asking one last question and then offering. Can I just, can I just make one correction from my sure. point of view? Of course. You say he's the only victor uh, in the story. Uh, I would add, and this is counterintuitive, but I would add Mayor Ariel. Uh, Mayor Ariel was the singer, songwriter, uh, who um, was in, in many ways our Bob Dylan. And um, my son, Gabriel, when I said that to him, he said, no, no, he said, he said Mayor was better than Dylan. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Mayor died in 1999, very much not recognized in his day. Today, he is celebrated as the greatest Israeli poet troubadour of the last 40, 50 years. Every year on his, the anniversary of his death or around then, thousands of people come together to sing his songs, most of them uh, too young to have known Mayer. And, and his long, complicated songs, they, they know all the words. And, and the greats of Israeli music come, and they vie for a spot on stage. To, each of them sings another one of his songs. It's a phenomenon that doesn't exist in this country for anyone else. We don't do it for Nomi Shemer. And, uh, and, and, and so, and, but the thing about Mayer that I find, in the end, so powerful is he led a, shall we say, from, from a religious perspective, a less than exemplary life for most of his years. You detail that with great uh, I, I precision. Do. Yes. I do, and, and Mayer uh, led a very public open marriage. Uh, he was one of the first uh, artists, musicians in this country to speak openly and constantly about drug use in, in the media. Uh, and so Mayer really, in, in Mayer's um, image in the public mind for most of his life was as the, the Israeli bohemian. Uh, toward the end of his life, he became an observant Jew, but very quiet, very private, and uh, he wouldn't impose this on anyone, and his music became more and more spiritual, and he wrote some of the most beautiful modern piyutim, prayer poems, that have appeared in, uh, in, 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 in Hebrew. And yeah. uh, let me, because let me push you. I, you yes. love him. You want, I love him, but let's, no, read the chat. No, okay. no. But could just, just really one Go last word, which is that <laughs> Mayer also in his life pointed the way toward a new form of non Orthodox Israeli Judaism. I see. And that's what, where I see his triumph. He, he helped create a kind of a synthesis between Bohemian Israel. And, and religiosity, which young Israelis are picking up no, on now and are, and are adopting. I want to end this part before we invite our, 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 our guests. <laughs> um, as I was saying before, and you love dreamers, but you're also scared of them. That's what you write about. Who are the dreamers who you're scared about today? I, I'm terrified of 
the frustrations and disappointments of our ideological camps. We can start with the Orthodox. The, the tremendous success of Orthodoxy in recovering after the Shoah, especially in this country, I'd say is due to, to two victories, or to two, two, really two, two achievements. The first was their ability to become the state religion, and the second was the settlement movement, which gave them vitality. And both of these achievements, I believe, are ephemeral. I think that both of these achievements in this generation and the next generation are going to be either overturned, erased, or significantly pulled back. And I am terrified of the day when that happens and when the Orthodox community is confronted with the limitations of its reach and that it is not actually going to be the future of the Jewish people or of the state of Israel. And, you know, Yeshayahu Leibovitch once said that when, when the settlements will be dismantled, the settlers will, uh, I think he said they'll convert to Christianity or, or they'll move to America. Uh, I don't think that that's either option is going to happen, but I, I'm afraid of their rage, and their rage at the rest of us. And I, f I have a similar fear of the frustrations and disappointments of liberal Jews that the more it becomes clear that peace is elusive, uh, the more it becomes clear that the 90s really ended in the Second Intifada, and that the year 2000 and the, and the Second Intifada was an historic turning point in the consciousness of a whole generation, in much the same way, I, I believe, that 1947 and the Arab world's rejection of partition then shaped the thinking of a generation, the first generation of Israelis, when that becomes increasingly clear to liberal Jews that we may have to live with this situation five years, 10 years, 15 years, I, I, I am very much afraid of, of their frustration and disappointment and how that might impact on Israel. And, and I think this really brings us back, Daniel, to a point you've been, you've been making in, this, in the course of this conversation, which is, the, the, I fear the Jewish tendency to place our tribal loyalties and insights over our, our communal and peoplehood loyalties. And, and, and I see symptoms of this in most of our camps, in our denominations. This is now a pattern. We are falling back into a pre-Holocaust pattern. Somehow the Holocaust and the creation of Israel in those early years managed to help us overcome our, our Yetzer Hara. And this is one of the, the Yitzre Hara of the Jewish people. And, um, and it's I, I think we, 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 we really need to look at that deeply. And so if I maybe end on a, on a, on a more positive note, which is that I do believe that we have the, the inner resources to overcome the, the, the fatal schism. Not our differences, but the ability not to allow our differences to destroy us. Because that's one way that this story can play out. And that's, one of the that's really the story that my that book tells. And in that sense, it's very much a cautionary tale. A cautionary. Yossi, thank you for writing a beautiful book. Thank you, thank you for writing a great book. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Let me see. Can I just see who'd like to? Um, okay. <laughs> Could you just tell me who you are? Oh, hi, Gil. <laughs> um, how much your book takes into account that Israeli society is not dichotomy? And uh, even among the uh, secular kibbutz movement people, there are people who support very right-wing ideas of annexing the territory. And on the other hand, within the uh, religious orthodox Zionist camp, there are people who think that peace and non-oppression of another people are more important than Yishuv El Tisrael. Thank you, Gil. I should say that uh, Gil was one of the paratroopers at the wall in 1967. <laughs> 
And Gil was actually one of the first people I went to interview. And in the end, my book took a different direction because I really focused on kibbutznikim and religious Zionists. Now, you're absolutely right that there is a, a, a very wide spectrum, both within religious Zionism and within the kibbutz movement as well. The, the, the first annexationist movement to be founded in this country in the summer of 1967, which was Hatnua Leman Eretz Yisrael Ashlema, was founded mostly by people on the left, including Tabenkin and leaders of, uh, of, of, of Kibbutz HaMeuchad in particular. I, I felt that the story that I was trying to tell was already so complicated that, that I do deal with some of these, these conflict within each camp, but I felt I needed to really focus on the mainstream of these two movements. And the mainstream of the kibbutz movement, as certainly in, in Ashomer Atzair, uh, Kibbutz Artsi, and, and, uh, and, 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 and afterwards much of Miuchad as well, and uh, uh, very much opposed, opposed the settlements. In fact, Peace Now, to some extent, came out of Ashomer Atzair came out of Kibbutz Artsi. The first Great Peace Now demonstration in, uh, in 1978 uh, was, was largely populated by, by Kibbutz Artsi, sending hundreds of buses from uh, the Kibbutzim of Ashomer Atzai. So I, I really wanted to focus on, on these two clashing dreams. You know, one of the ways, there are many ways that one could divide Zionism. The, different, the differences within Zionism, left versus right, uh, capitalist versus, versus socialist, religious versus anti-clerical. But one of, for me, the most interesting division within Zionism is between the normalizers and the utopians, the messianists. And the story that I tell is about a civil war being fought within the camp of the Zionist messianists, between the kibbutznikim who moved toward peace now and the religious Zionists who moved toward the settlements. I felt that that was a story that, that needed to be told. And, uh, and look, there's, there's a lot that, that was left out, but the book uh, is already close to 600 pages. Uh, it, it was 800 pages a few months before it was published. And my editor said to me, go ahead, it's your funeral. And, uh, and that's what convinced me to, uh, to edit it down. So. Yes, please. In your talk that you just sort of concluded with, you said one of the things that worries you is that when the Orthodox establishment here in Israel realizes it can no longer maintain the state religion and its power, I, how is it, I mean, with the growing, with the growth of Orthodoxy in this country and the growth of the Haredim, it just in sheer numbers, how could they be losing their power and their influence? Who are, who, who are you? Uh, uh, Jeff Lipschel, sorry, Jeff. From where? New Jersey. Not far from Lakewood, by the way. I heard of it, I heard of it. Um, this is something that uh, we speak a lot about in our Engaging Israel seminar. And look, it could go that direction, but there's another scenario as well. Uh, and this is something that, that I learned from you, Daniel, really to look at the Haredi world's success as, as its potential uh, undoing in that the, 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 the more that the Haredi community grows, the harder it is for their rabbis to control their young people. When they were smaller and more intact, they were able to exercise real control over their communities. It's becoming increasingly harder. The larger they become, the more the rest of the country realizes that we can't continue subsidizing them for very practical reasons. They will bankrupt the country. If, uh, if, if, if we have to continue subsidizing this unnatural dependency of the Haredi community on, on the state. And so the more they grow, the less tenable the current nature of the relationship becomes. Uh, there's, there's, there's another piece of this, which is the, the hostile takeover of the chief rabbinate by the Haredi parties. And I say a hostile takeover because the chief rabbinate was founded as a religious Zionist institution. The Haredim wanted nothing to do with the chief rabbinate. But now that they've taken it over because they realize it's a source of power and funding, they have in effect emptied the institution of its significance and of its constituency. 
because the Haredi, we now have two Haredi chief rabbis, but the Haredim don't look toward the chief rabbinate for their authority. They have their own rabbis. There is no longer a constituency for the chief rabbinate. It is, it is, an, it is a bankrupt institution morally and practically. And that means that one of these days, years, decades, this institution, I believe, is going to collapse. And, uh, and so I'm, in that sense, I'm an optimist. And it's, and it's a function <laughs> of the overreach of the overreach of the Haredi community. They went too far, and they have forced the rest of us to now push back. I'm trying to be moderately gender sensitive in my allocation of questions, but you're going to have to help me here. <laughs> so I'm just going to wait for a second. Um, and does anybody have a question, please? <laughs> I realize that. Um, does anybody have a question, please? <laughs> I, I see the hands who are here. I'm waiting for a few others. I'm are there trying. Any women in the audience. I didn't say. I, I was, is there anybody else who um, has a question? Um, if there isn't, just I'm going to wait. Okay. Um, just in the order that I saw them, please. Yes, sir. Uh, just, you know. Nice to see you. <laughs> Uh, let's, let's be a little mystical. In your next Gilgul, right, when you will write a book about this generation, maybe, do you see today any characters, heroes, that they will be maybe mentioned in that book, having a huge impact in, in, in the Israeli society of the Jewish people today? Well, you know, the question is that um, in my next Gilgul, um, and I don't think you're meaning in this life, my evolution. <laughs> he doesn't uh, want to write another book for 11 years. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, who, who today might warrant uh, a, a, a book about uh, the impact that they had on Israel? You know, when I, when I wrote this book, it's interesting. I... I the question that was uppermost in my mind is what would a Jewish reader 100 years from now want to know about who we were and what this story felt like from the inside? And that, that actually freed me from taking sides in the book. I needed really to think about this story as if it's already been resolved. Imagine that the debate over the territories and the future of Israel is already known and it's 100 years from now. And so when you say about the next Gilgul, I was thinking, about the next Gilgul, but really trying in a way to write for that, for that Gilgul. As far as today, I, I could come up with a very long list of people who would not qualify in, uh, in such a book. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot harder to, uh, to think of who the heroes, uh, who the heroes will be. Uh, I don't want to name names, but I would say that, that for me, uh, the the heroes are those who are going to help us make the transition from the, the era of state building to, um, to, to the era in which we become a people again and, and in which we take responsibility for the next phase of the creativity of Judaism. And I think that there are such people and, and I I think that we are laying the ground today for the next great revolution, spiritual revolution in Judaism. It may take a generation, it may take two generations, but I feel it is beginning now. And uh, there, are, there are signs of that in, in Israeli music, for example. Some of you know this is a passion of mine. And, and what, what thrills me about Israeli popular music uh, is that it has moved from being the carrier of the secular Zionist ethos in its previous incarnation to now being the carrier of the re-Judaization of Israeli culture. And I would look to some of those musicians, uh, Ehud Banai, I would say. There are, uh, there are others who I would, uh, Beri Sakharov. There are real, the visionaries of our generation, the poets of our generation, maybe the prophets, are, are in part coming through the music. Hi, Bill Hamilton. Um, 
Your, uh, your book talks about a single event and multiple different responses to that event. Uh, and I just wonder, even though the event is shared by all the respondents and they have a close bond with each other, and that's why they play off of each other so interestingly over the time, if we move to July the 2nd, 2014, um, we heard and we are aware that we were together as a people for the funeral of three teens just uh, a day ago, and we were all on the same page. It wasn't exactly June of 67, but, and we will have multiple different responses to, as a people, to the, that event, and we're already seeing it. We're seeing the separation. And I don't know if we're going to have seven different responses, the way you chronicle, seven different uh, uh, types of responses to that experience. But do you have any hope that the different responses in Israel going forward, rage and cynicism and disappointment and all the emotions, have any hope for playing off of each other and being in a di dialectic the way in which the figures uh, that you model in the book do? You know, I would have answered that question differently yesterday than I would today. And uh, with the murder of, uh, of this boy in Beit Hanina, I, 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 uh, I was downtown this afternoon. I was at, uh, went to uh, Kikar Tzion. There was going to be a gathering of, uh, of, ta of Tag Meir. And in fact, it did happen. And I, I went to, be, it's, Tag Meir is a response to the extreme right of Tag Mechir. And uh, this is a movement that was founded in the spirit of my, my beloved late friend and mentor, Rabbi Menachem Froman, who was really Israel's great uh, interfaith activist with Islam. And, um, and his wife and kids have taken this on, and they're now leading this movement. And I, so I went down, and, um, and I was waiting for that. I got to the square a little early, and I was waiting for them to come. And there was a big group of, uh, of young people, and, um, and they had formed memorial candles on the ground uh, in two words, and the word said, Mavet La'aravim. And, um, and there was a woman there who was trying to get them to, to take that away, and it was starting to get very ugly. Police came, and I just said, you know, I, I can't stay here. I can't, I, and, I, and I left. I didn't wait for the, for the Tag Meir uh, demonstration. I just, I just could not be in, in a public space in Jerusalem at that moment. And so, um, and so my, my answer to you is I, what I fear most of all, and this maybe will take us back to maybe a fuller answer, Danielle, to, to your question. I fear most of all the true, the deep true believers among us. And, and I fear the, the, the ability of, of a few people on the fanatical right to destroy us in the way that, that they destroyed us uh, in 1994, Baruch Goldstein and those who supported him. To this day, Purim is not Purim for me since then. Uh, the way they destroyed us in 1995 and the way they might uh, have destroyed this moment yesterday. And I fear a similar phenomenon on the far left, the, the Jewish Voice for Peace, which actively joined with the Presbyterians last week to push, to push divestment, to, to criminalize the Jewish people, the Jewish state. And, and I fear the, the, the certainty. You know, we're a people of unbelievable certainty. And my favorite example of, of how we can't let go once we have a revelation, you know, is, is, a, is a sect called the Donmeh in Turkey. People know the Donmeh, the followers of Shabtai Tzvi. There, there are still reported sightings of the Donmeh in Istanbul. 
certainly as, as recently as a generation ago, the, the donme was active. And there's something in the Jewish personality when we get hold of an idea, it's like we, we're imprinted with this longing for Sinai, for, for revelation, for absolute truth. We get hold of an idea, we make the best communists, we, we don't let go, you know, and, and, and there has never been a reckoning within the Jewish people about that, by the way. The, by the, uh, in, in the role that so many Jews played in, 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 the, in Stalin. And, uh, and so there's something in us that, that craves absolute truth. And this is one of the sources of our, of our destruction. I'm just looking a second. Yes, please. I mean. <laughs> uh, so I'm an educator. My name's Edna. I'm from the Toronto High School in Toronto, Canada. And um, as an educator, and currently I teach grade 8 Hebrew, I'm wondering how did you bring uh, the future of Israel Zionism to, to the youth <laughs> Any ideas, Daniel? <laughs> You know, I, um, I've, I've begun speaking in, uh, in high schools, in Jewish high schools, something that I, I feel very pulled to do. And, and what, I've, what, I start, what, I've, what I've been saying to, to the students is that I've explained something about their grandparents' generation and the Jewish challenges they faced after the Shoah and building the state or building strong diaspora communities. Uh, then I spoke about my generation, the generation of the Soviet Jewry movement in the diaspora, of, of, uh, of the ingathering, of defending the state. And so the challenge that, that your generation faces is, is to make sense of the Jewish story. Because the Jewish story is now under increasing attack, the legitimacy of the 20th century Jewish story. And, and that attack takes different forms. In much of the Muslim world, it is the literal factualness of the story that's under attack. Did the Holocaust really happen? Uh, were, was there an ancient Jewish presence in the land of Israel? And in the West, the attack is, is more subtle, but no less devastating. And the assault on the Jewish story is on the, the, the decency of the story the legitimacy of the story. 1948, was 1948 a, a, a source of inspiration or was it, a, or was it, or was it a, a, a symbol of evil? These are the questions that their generation is going to have to deal with urgently. And I say to them that you need to defend the Jewish story, but that's not enough. Because if you only defend the story without understanding what the story means, you will not, in the, in the long term, be able to sustain that defense. And so your generation, I said, my generation, I don't believe my generation is going to come up with interesting ideas anymore. We are who we are. And, you, and, and, and we keep arguing the same things over and over again. I said, your generation has to figure out what is the Jewish people? Who are we? What does it mean that we survived until this moment? And not just survived, what does it mean that we, we managed to reach our, our greatest moment of renaissance immediately after the Shoah? What does that say about us? What does it say not only about our spiritual vitality, but perhaps something of our spiritual purpose? Who are we? We don't know anymore who we are. We speak about the Jewish people and Jewish solidarity in Israel. We don't understand our story anymore. And so what I say to them is I don't have answers for you, but this is the challenge in the same way that my parents' generation gave my generation a set of challenges and, and, and of incomplete an incomplete process. The incomplete process we're handing over to you is you're going to need to make sense of Judaism. What is the inner meaning of this story? What is God? You know, we, we are, we, in, in a way, our generation, uh, we lived the shattering of, of, of the 19th century. From the 19th century until the post-Holocaust era, there was one form of Judaism. And the crisis that we're living is that, is that the 19th century is over. All of the different ideologies that we generated in the 19th century have all really reached a dead end. 
And we're living still, we're living somehow in the, in the, in the shadow, the aftermath of the vitality of these, of these ideologies. But one, one of the things that the 19th century did was, was for the first time break with the meaning, with the centrality of God in Jewish identity, the centrality of God in Judaism. And then, of course, the Shoah confirmed that and 70 years of Soviet communism and our experience in the West and secular Zionism. All of these phenomena converged to undermine the centrality of God. But, but for 3,000 years before that, if you had asked any Jew at any time in Jewish history, who are we, what is our story about? This is Judaism, in effect, is the love story between God and a people being enacted in history. That's what Jews always believed about who we are. And we've lost the centrality of God in the story. And what we need is somehow to figure out, does that have any meaning anymore? Because the other alternatives, I think, really, as I say, are spent. Is there some way for us to reclaim the centrality of God, but in a way that makes sense to us as, as postmodern, post-19th and 20th century Jews? You'll see again. On behalf of everybody, thank you. Um, for those of you who are interested, um, Yossi will be next to the, uh, will be happy to sign um, the books that you want to get for your spouses, children, grandchildren, etc., cetera, um, because you all already have your own. Um, thank you again, and Laila Tov, everyone. Thank you.